When I booked these programs, I had no clue Russia was going to invade the <laughs> Ukraine. And it is, as with most of our programs, for some reason, world events seem to collide with what we are talking about at that point in time. It's serendipitous in a bad way. So, Christy has been with us before. She's been here, I think, once in person, and yep. then you did Zoom last did, year, right? Yep. And she's a professor at the College of St. Ben and St. John's. Um, she has a PhD in poli sci from the University of Washington. She has her MA in international relations um, and in international economics from Johns Hopkins and advanced international studies. Um, she is just a wonderful, wonderful speaker on anything she touches. And she's going to talk about Myanmar. And I know when I saw this topic come up in the book, which can now be found in the library for free, for you to read articles about every single presentation. There will be two copies down there. I thought, meh, where's Myanmar? So I pulled up my globe. I mean, I kind of knew, right? Sort of like I kind of used to know where the Ukraine was, but now I really know where the <laughs> Ukraine is. And many of the things that Myanmar has been going through internally really, really reflects what we're watching today, current time. So I'm not going to say anything more about this. I'm going to turn it over to Christy and let her start her presentation. Um, if you can, maybe just hold questions until the end, and then we'll go through them. All right? Fabulous. Christy. Fabulous. All right. How's that? Fine. OK, good. Um, so yeah, my name is Christy Siver, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the everyday human catastrophe in Myanmar. One thing that I'll say about just Russia and Ukraine, and I'm happy to answer questions about it, um, but there is a lot of interaction between Russia and Myanmar, and I can actually talk about that particularly in terms of arms sales. And so we see the negative consequences of Russia, and particularly Vladimir Putin's kind of vision for Russia as kind of returning to the Russian Empire through some of his actions in Myanmar as well. So um, I have been talking about Myanmar with my students since at least 2017. My students every year do a crisis simulation where they take on the roles of different actors in the crisis and they try and resolve the problem. This year, I, I happened to see them earlier today and I told them I was coming down to speak with you and they just wanted you to know that they solved this whole problem a couple of weeks ago. So if only the leaders would listen, everything would be fine. But I call this an everyday humanitarian or everyday human catastrophe because what we see in Ukraine right now, and we sometimes see exceptional events, and they all kind of come at once, and so they seem very shocking in that way. In Myanmar, and I'll talk about this, 14,000 people have been killed, which doesn't seem a lot, but it's a bunch every day. And many, many thousands of people have been displaced. And so, um, you know, I think Renee's kind of question, what, what is Myanmar, where is Myanmar? This is a question I hear from a lot of students. Um, and then when I kind of tell them a little bit about it, they are just so shocked that there isn't more global attention on this. So we'll talk a little bit about that today and some different ways that we can try and kind of get at that. So I wanted to start this talk actually because I had this intuition that people don't know a lot about Myanmar. You might uh, remember the country Burma, <laughs> which is how, still how the United States State Department refers to Myanmar. The name was changed in 1999 or 1989 by the military rulers of the time. And uh, at first, it was kind of seen as support for the democracy activists, if you use the old, old name Burma. Um, probably about 2006-2007, Aung San Suu Kyi, who was the leader of the National League of Democracy and who I'll talk a lot about, said, you know, actually this doesn't matter. In our language, it's just a more formal way of saying the same thing. So I have kind of gone with Myanmar. I think everyone kind of talks about Myanmar, but you might be more familiar with it in terms of her. So this is the largest country in mainland Southeast Asia, and it has about 54 million inhabitants. That's as of 2017, so those numbers could have changed. Um, since the military coup, which happened in February 2021, estimates range from 1,600 to 12,000 people killed. And it has been a very deliberate campaign by the military junta to kill any civilians and to instill fear that you know, if you go out on the street, if you oppose the military government, you will be killed. And if you're not killed, you're imprisoned. So 
440,000 people have been displaced. 14.4 uh, million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. And a UN report that was just released this month said there are unprecedented political, socio socioeconomic, human rights in humanitarian crisis. Uh, the military junta, so these are pictures of some of the protesters. The military junta is facing charges at both the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice. So there are some efforts to try and address this issue. But this issue has really kind of put on display the challenges of ASEAN, which is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. This is a regional organization that these countries are a member of that I'll talk a little uh, about a little bit more in the presentation. That whole international community has kind of looked to ASEAN to solve this problem. There's this kind of that norm of ASEAN centrality. But I think we're starting to see, and I can tell you about some events that have just happened recently, that ASEAN is not going to be able to manage this crisis, and there is a need for the international community to step in. So here's a little bit about what I'll cover today. I'll do some really brief historical background. I don't want to kind of get all lost in the weeds of that, but if you have questions, let me know and I can try and answer them. Um, then we'll talk about the military coup of 2021 and the brutal repression that has followed it. I'll give you a little bit of background on the main players in the conflict, including civilians, the Tatma Da, the military, the MUG, which is the National Unity Government. One thing that's really useful in, in the booklet is that it has a list of all the acronyms because they can get kind of overwhelming. And then the PDF, which is the People's Defense Forces, and then ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. There are other players, obviously China, Russia, who are significant. I won't cover those in, in depth, but I can answer questions about them if you have some. And then what is the situation in the country today, and what is the hope? So if we, and, and I start the historical background in 1948, so uh, Burma was a British colonial possession. Um, it achieved independence in 1948. Um, in so from 1948 to 1962, there was really just a lot of instability. There was kind of attempts to have civilian government, but there was a lot of ethnic infighting going on, and it was just very, very unstable. <laughs> um, in 1962, the mili a military coup left, <coughs> led by the Army Chief of Staff, uh, took power, and they really maintained power without any kind of efforts at democracy. Um, we'll talk about genuine efforts at democracy until 2010. So really, Mil Myanmar, for most of its early life, was run by a military. Um, in 1988, we start to see the first actual freedom protests. And so in 1990, 1988, there was the People Power Uprising. This was student-led uprisings demanding democracy. And we see the emergence of Aung San Suu Kyi. So Aung San Suu Kyi is the daughter of Aung San, who was a, very, a military hero and a national hero. He unfortunately was assassinated the year before Burma achieved its independence. She happened to actually be visiting her mother. She had left and gone to the, the UK, studied at Oxford. She was home caring for her mother when the People Power uh, movement started. And uh, basically, I'm sure that people appealed to her to, to join the movement, and she did. And so she became a democracy leader. Um, uh, in 1988, the military, kind of seeing all this uprising, declared martial law and banned public demonstrations. And there was a crack crackdown around the country. So at that time, 3,000 were killed, 3,000 were imprisoned, and 10,000 fled the country. So you had kind of a lot of instability. There are uh, famous photographs uh, from this <coughs> era of monks kind of like immolating themselves on fire, kind of in protest of the regime. Um, in 1989, that's when the military changed the country's name from Burma to Myanmar. Um, and in 1990, they actually held multi-party elections. 80% um, of the seats were won by Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, National League for Democracy, or NLD. Um, the military ignored the results and was like, yeah, that didn't happen. They arrested uh, opposition politicians, including Aung San Suu Kyi, and she was held functionally under house arrest until 2010. Um, in 1991, she won the Nobel Peace Prize, so kind of recognized for her efforts and her sacrifices on behalf of Myanmar's democracy. Um, 
things started moving again in 2008. In 2008, the military drafted a new constitution that was passed in a heavily controlled referendum. So they kind of made these efforts at legitimacy, but they still wanted to make sure they knew what the outcome was going to be. Um, in 2010, kind of following this, there were multi-party elections that were run primarily by pro-military parties. The NLD actually boycotted these elections because Aung San Suu Kyi was still in house arrest. In 2015 though, and that's the kind of the results you can see here, um, Ansa, uh, she was, uh, the multi-party multi elections led to a large NLD victory. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi was prevented from law from becoming president. Um, there was a law that if you had children who were foreign nationals, you can't be president. But she actually then, they created a position for her called state counselor, which actually ended up being potentially even more powerful than president. And she was kind of seen as an equal with her NLD compatriot who was the president. Um, and this kind of led to a, fr a fragile kind of power sharing regime. And this is at the time when President Obama went to Myanmar, lifted long time US sanctions, and so there was a lot of hope that there was gonna be more development in Myanmar. I think the next significant um, portion of, of history that, that we need to talk about is the Rohingya genocide. So as kind of Aung San Suu Kyi is coming into power, as she's kind of working with these military generals, um, she's also cracking down on her own critics in the media and civil society. So there already starts to be some question about, you know, what what is what what happened to our democracy activists who won the Nobel Prize? Um, the NLD itself was isolated. They didn't have a lot of support in the ethnic minority regions, and so even they were kind of, of struggling. But I mean, still like widely beloved amongst the Burmese majority population. So the, the history of the persecution of the Rohingya Muslim minority, so these are Rohingya Muslims who live in Rakhine State, which is kind of a, along the ocean. Um, in 19, so, so there's a long history of that. They've always been kind of marginalized in Myanmar. But in 1982, the government, the military junta, passed a new citizenship law, which denied the Rohingya citizenship basically said, you people are just uh, old Bangladeshi <coughs> refugees who came during the time of the British Empire, and we don't recognize you as our country. And there's actually a lot of really hateful things said by Burmese monks that stoked a lot of violence. Um, and uh, I, won't, I won't repeat what they've said here, but there are some really devastating documentaries that were done by Al Jazeera at the time that really that, that interviewed these monks, and, and they just really were like, Muslims are fine, they just need to go somewhere else. I mean, that, and that was the nicest thing I could say. Um, so there were continual attacks by the military and harassment by the Buddhist majority, particularly in Arakan, the region where they live. In 2014, Rohingya were excluded from the census, so you literally don't count, right? You, you know, you are not a part of our country. In 2017, after a lot of frustration on the part of the Rohingya, a small band that was really actually pretty marginal, if you think about the whole group of the Rohingya, created a, a kind of a militant group called ARSA. And ARSA was this kind of um, violent group that was gonna like, lead violent resistance against the military government and against the people who were harassing them. They attacked a police station, they killed some police officers, that basically provided the military with the justification to lead pretty much a, a kind of complete region-wide um, either killing or just burning down villages of the Rohingya people. So um, the military led a massacre, killing uh, villagers, burning down their homes. More than 700,000 people fled the country into Bangladesh, and many of those people still remain in Bangladesh, um, living in refugee camps. And the Bangladeshi government has actually done a lot to try and welcome them, to try and provide services, but it's a lot for the Bangladeshi government to bear. Um, the, you know, the Rohingya are starting to try to work um, because of course they want to have some kind of money for their family. And that's creating problems in Bangladesh with kind of, you know, lower class workers who say, you know, Rohingya are willing to work for less, they are willing to work in these informal conditions. And so Bangladesh is kind of struggling um, and they actually built a camp um, on an island off the coast of, from where the current refugee refugee camps are. Um, 
which also seems very, very victim to things like tsunamis, which are actually quite common in Myanmar. Um, so a lot of people have said this is not a good solution. And we see, unfortunately, recently that the Rohingya refugees are becoming so frustrated with their conditions that they're kind of following the lead of some of the migrants in Greece and they're just burning down the refugee camps. And so this is just creating more displacement and it's not really solving the problem, right? Because no one, basically Bangladesh and Myanmar have tried to negotiate kind of refugee return, but of course the Rohingyas don't want to go unless they have some kind of protection of their safety. Um, so in, tw in November 2019, the Gambia um, filed a case against Myanmar for violation of the Geneva Convention, um, which, or sorry, the Genocide Convention. Um, Aung San Suu Kyi, as pictured here, actually traveled to The Hague to defend the military's actions the, the, that same month. Um, the prosecutor, in that same month, the prosecutor for the International Criminal Court opened an investigation into the actions of Myanmar's military generals, and you might have heard that Facebook removed all of Myanmar's military generals because they were using the platform to stoke hatred against the Rohingya. So, Aung San Suu Kyi, this was really when, um, this is when basically Aung San Suu Kyi's human rights credentials were essentially lost because she refuses to say the name Rohingya, she refuses to recognize they exist as a group, and, the, and, and this really fueled uh, Burmese oppression of the Rohingya even further. So Rohingya that were still in the country were stuck in these kind of prison camp-like conditions, and there was really the military, there was, they, uh, they had very little protection. And UN human rights investigators that sought to go into Burma to kind of check on the conditions in these camps were actually not allowed in to visit the camps. Um, so it's, it's just, it was a really, really bad situation. That all led up to the coup. So just to backtrack one second, in November 2020, there were elections in Myanmar, the NLD won again, and they were set to take even greater gains. Um, and in February of 2021, they were scheduled to convene the parliament and kind of decide on a new governing coalition. Um, at the same time, on the very day that they were supposed to convene the parliament, this exercise instructor unwittingly captured the coup on her video, that she, on her video that she was making of her exercise routine. Um, so the military detained politicians and prominent civil society activists. Aung San Suu Kyi was imprisoned. Um, they were detained before they could convene the parliament to form a government. Um, and the Myanmar military basically claimed that the NLD had committed widespread election fraud, which I think we can we can have a sense that that's not we, that's not a good feeling. That's not something that, that is that is going to go over well. As a result, in the country, peaceful protests broke out throughout the country, and throughout February, these protests were kind of tolerated. You know, members of the military, other governments, was just kind of like standing aside, didn't really know what to do. And these protests were really oppressive. I mean, hundreds and thousands of people came out into the streets. There was this kind of sense that like, of, of apology to all the ethnic minorities that had been marginalized. Um, there was a nationwide strike of civil servants, bankers, and hospital staff across the country. The military junta then cut off the internet. Some people still have access through VPNs, which we, we also see in Russia. Um, and they imposed curfews, so people just couldn't go out anymore. Um, as of right now, 1,500 civilians have been killed in Myanmar, um, and there are 8,800 people in custody. So in March, the military kind of changed its tune and said, no more protests, and, and we're, we're cutting this off. So who are the main players in this crisis? Um, Probably, I, I put the civilians first because I think they're the most impressive. Um, they really have kind of taken um, a role in the defendants of their, in defending their country. Um, now, as of now, um, actually, uh, as these are dates from February 1, 2022, which is of course the anniversary of the coup, there have been 11,000 arrested and 8,700 remain in detention. Myanmar does this, uh, kind of has this weird holiday where they release political prisoners kind of as a gesture of goodwill. So actually an American journalist who was sentenced to 10 years in prison was released, it usually happens in the fall, was released as part of this mass prisoner release. 
but people who are who are getting out of prison, you know, have often been tortured, suffered tremendous abuse. Um, some of them go right back out and protest. Some of them are just leaving the country. A lot of journalists have left the country and gone to places like Australia, and so they try and remain kind of connected to the region. Um, but but these protests are still going on um, where they can. The military, of course, is is immediately arrested. So the second main player is the Tatmadar, or the military. And they they have roots, this organization has roots in the Burma Independence Army from 1941. These were a group of revolutionaries, including Aung San, so Aung San Suu Kyi's father. Um, but he was assassinated um, in, in 1947, before independence. At the time of independence, this Burmese independence force uh, joined with other militias to form a national armed force. Um, the military now kind of sees the protesters as traitors to the country of Myanmar. And the people in the military are subjected to intense propaganda. So they really live in these uh, kind of barracks that are very, very isolated from other people, isolated from their family. Um, but we have seen increasing numbers of defectors. So there have been some people who are leaving the Myanmar military, but it's still very challenging. Um, the head of the military junta is General Min Aung Long. Um, and where do they get their money from? Well, they've actually been very effective in consolidating a lot of companies. And for a long time, the, Burmese mili or the, the Myanmar military kind of had to be self-funded. So they weren't necessarily getting funding from the government, so they created all these different uh, corporate holdings. So they have the Myanmar Economic Holdings Limited, or the MEHL, the Myanmar Economic Corporation Limited, which includes things like, it, it's a big conglomerate of lots of different companies that do things like banking, mining, tobacco, and tourism. And it's been able to insulate itself from, uh, from accountability and oversight, because it basically doesn't have to ever ask anyone for money. Um, these two major conglomerates have been sanctioned, right? The heads of those bodies have been sanctioned by the United States and European, and European countries. Um, but we haven't yet sanctioned the Myanmar oil and gas enterprise, the MOGE, which is a huge source of funds for Myanmar. Um, they export gas to China and other countries in the region, some of them not being democracies. Um, but we do see some action on this. Chevron recently announced that it was pulling out of Myanmar. So we see some action to reduce these kind of economic resources, but not enough yet, right? And China is kind of in this kind of strange role of wanting to see stability in Myanmar, because of course it has a very long band, land border with Myanmar, but also in wanting that, that stability is needed for economic development, both in Myanmar, which would be beneficial to China, but also for Yunnan province, which is the province that borders Myanmar that suffers from a lot of poverty. So all of this instability and civic strife actually hurts Chinese efforts in that uh, province as well. China and Russia have rebuffed efforts by the UN Security Council to condemn the military. There was a UN General Assembly resolution that was passed, but of course that is not binding in the same way as Security Council resolution is. So the former government or the former NLD of Myanmar what was left, what, what the people who weren't arrested, basically kind of tried to create a government in exile. And the first organization they created was the Committee Representing Pyong Du So Kuala, ah, and I'm not confident in all of that pronunciation, but this was really NLD, right? NLD members coming together. They came together in April 2021, um, and they, they basically said, hey, we're the rightful government in exile. Recognizing that they needed, that, that they were getting a lot of criticism because the ethnic minorities were saying, hey, like the NLD didn't represent us and you probably want our help in trying to, to retake the country from the military junta, the CRPH then formed the National Unity Government, the NUG. And it is much more diverse than the NLD. You can see kind of they have all their meetings on Zoom because they're all in different places. Um, and they use the three-fingered salute from the Hunger Games. Um, uh, so, uh, it, and so the NUG includes a coalition of ethnic minorities. 
which I think will be important if they have actually ever take power. And they, we can talk about where areas where they are trying to assert power in places like the International Court of Justice. They have argued that we should be the rightful people who are standing there kind of uh, facing the Gambia's accusations. They have said to the International Criminal Court that we recognize the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction in Myanmar. So they're kind of trying to assert their recognition, but they haven't yet been recognized even by the United States or other Western powers. Um, so then you have the PDF. So these are the People's Defense Forces and Ethnic Militias. And actually Deutsche Welle has been doing some really great work kind of interviewing people that are going into these areas. But these are your college age students, young people who are working in cell phone companies. I mean really just a kind of a, a very assorted variation of civilians who gave up basically on peaceful protests and have gone out to these ethnic minority regions kind of at the margins of Myanmar and said train us and so the ethnic militias especially the Kachin and the Karin and we have a big Karin community here in Minnesota um, have said okay we'll train you we'll support you so there has been a lot of support for protests and they've also had a few battlefield successes Basically, in the year since the coup, the Myanmar military junta has not been able to take control of the whole country of Myanmar. And that really speaks to, I mean, I think that's where we see the resonance with Ukraine, it really speaks to the power of the resistance, right? Because you would think the military basically has every advantage going for them, and yet they still are not able to, to capture the whole country. And so there's a lot of kind of strong morale and these ethnic armed organizations um, have basically said, if, if you come from the cities, we will train you and we will support you, like we'll feed you, right? It's not great conditions. It's, it's, it's a little bit hard for some of the younger people to get used to, but of course the younger people are, are highly motivated because they have grown up in a more democratic Myanmar. And so this is a tremendous loss for them, whereas their older family members might say, well, we kind of have been down this road before. And so a lot of young people are joining this organ these organizations. So the last main player that we'll talk about now, although I'm happy to, to bring more people in, are is ASEAN, so the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. The countries, I'll say the list, but I don't expect you to remember it, there will not be a test, are Brunei, Burma or Myanmar, Cambodia, Timor-Leste, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. And one thing that's important about that list of countries is that there is a mix of authoritarian states and democracies in there. And so that makes it very hard for ASEAN to function and deal with this crisis. So the ASEAN Charter is kind of unique because it contains these principles of non-interference, consensus, and unity and diversity. So ASEAN is really a grouping that is meant to kind of facilitate dialogue, facilitate economic cooperation and development. It's not great at resolving conflicts because it really, it, it doesn't operate off of a majority, off of a vote, right? You have to kind of achieve consensus and they have this underlying principle of non-interference. And so that kind of raises a bunch of issues where they've had struggles in dealing with this. So we also see a bit of an authoritarian resistance or resurgence in some of the countries in Southeast Asia. There was a military coup in Thailand in 2014. In Cambodia, Hun Sen took power in a coup in 1985, and he has been very friendly with the Myanmar military generals. He just visited Myanmar in March. Um, and China is kind of a growing power, and they, they support autocrats in Southeast Asia because they're kind of in their wheelhouse in terms of maybe focusing on economic development, and China is a very appealing supporter to those countries because they don't ask questions about human rights. So there's been a lack of an international community response. Basically, everyone at the international level has said ASEAN should deal with this and kind of, I think they're trying to point, to kind of sell this as we trust ASEAN to handle this, but it's getting pretty clear that they're not able to do that. In late September of 2021, ASEAN took the strongest action it's taken yet, which was to bar General Min Aung from the annual ASEAN summit. 
But basically, these five points of the five point consensus that ASEAN came up with immediate cessation of violence, constructive dialogue, the designation of the special envoy, humanitarian assistance, and that the and that the special envoy would go to meet me, go to Myanmar to meet all parties. Very few of those have actually happened, aside from the de designation of the special envoy. You know, there hasn't been a ceasefire. Um, also, notice that the five point consensus doesn't assign blame. It doesn't condemn the military junta, and so that's it again has put kind of ASEAN in a weak position. So the special envoy has gone to Myanmar once and was denied the ability to meet with Aung San Suu Kyi. Other democratic countries in ASEAN objected strongly to this, and they said you cannot go back there again unless you meet with Aung San Suu Kyi. So he was supposed to go back about this time and hasn't gone back because the, the military junta is basically like you can't meet with her. Um, Hun Sen, though, just recently traveled to Myanmar um, and, of course, didn't meet with her. and was chummy with the general. So it kind of exposes these, these divisions within ASEAN that, that suggest that this is not, this is not going to be solved by ASEAN. I, I think that there's just not a lot of mechanisms within the ASEAN Charter that give them power for this. So what is the situation like today? Well, actually, just yesterday, um, March 15th, Michelle Bachelet, who's the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, released a report that called, that called on the international community to take concerted, immediate measures to stem the spiral of violence in Myanmar. She said the military has shown flagrant disregard for human life, bombarding populated areas with airstrikes and heavy weapons, deliberately targeting civilians, again, echoes of Ukraine, um, and she said that many have been shot in the head, burned to death, arbitrarily arrested, tortured, or used as human shields. And she really kind of gathered data from this report f from speaking to refugees, people who have escaped the country and kind of escaped the military junta. So, you know, it, it, there's an irony in that she's raising these issues at the United Nations at the same time that we're seeing something similar go on in Ukraine, and yet this hardly makes the headlines, right? Because it's somewhere far away in a country that we don't know very much about. So what is the hope for the future? And so I have a couple of graphs on here that I think are helpful. The first is just to note that this has been devastating for Myanmar's economy. So it had kind of lower levels, weaker levels of economic growth in the years leading up to the coup, and the coup itself has devastated it. So the Biden administration was actually very quick to act when it came into power. They condemned the coup, they demanded restoration of democracy, they have put sanctions on leaders of the coup, they have put restrictions on the ability of US companies to do business with corporations or individuals connected to the Myanmar military. They froze a billion dollars of assets in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And if you listen to The World, which is my favorite podcast, um, the yesterday, the the foreign minister of Myanmar, of the NUG, was in, was uh, interviewed, and she said, give us that money because we have a war we need to fight. And so again, that's kind of the NUG trying to establish, like, you know, we are the legitimate heirs of Aung San Suu Kyi's government. Uh, there have been, and so the U.S. has actually provided Myanmar with a lot of aid. Since 2012, we provided $1.5 billion for the democratic transition. We provided $16.5 million for COVID-19. Um, we provided people who are in the United States have temporary protected status so they can stay in the United States. And even in August, so after the coup, we provided $50 million to NGOs to assist with COVID because uh, Myanmar had a huge COVID spike in this time, which makes a lot of sense because all of the hospital workers and all the medical workers were on strike. And so there was just, no one was trusting the government. The government actually has tried to distribute lots and lots of vaccines. They vaccinated a bunch of Rohingya people, probably involuntarily, but I mean, I suppose that's kind of a good thing. Um, but basically nobody trusts the government, so they want to get the vaccine, and then that creates more problems. So in January of this year, the US, Britain, and Canada imposed new sanctions against additional officials in Myanmar, targeted judicial officials involved in the prosecution of Aung San Suu Kyi, because she's already been prosecuted for a couple of different 
seemingly very minor crimes, but she's been served with like, I think a 10 year prison sentence, and she still has more crimes she's gonna be charged on. Um, so the likelihood of seeing her anytime soon is low. Um, and they also have sanctioned the directorate responsible for buying weapons overseas. And that's really where we see Russia, China, uh, Serbia's role um, there in those, in those weapons provisions. But these sanctions, again, did not target natural gas reserves. Um, so the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Myanmar has called for an arms embargo. Um, but China, Russia, and Serbia have continued to sell weapons to the junta. The special rapporteur said that despite the evidence of the military junta's atrocity crimes being committed with impunity since launching a coup of last year, UN Security Council members Russia and China continue to provide the, military, the Myanmar military junta with numerous fighter jets, armored vehicles, and in the case of Russia, the promise of further arms. During the same period, Serbia has authorized rockets and artillery for the exports. So while there are kind of efforts to try and provide sanctions, I think we really are at this point. I actually had the great opportunity to interview a professor from Carleton who was a former fighter from 1998 in Myanmar, and he actually argued for providing arms to the opposition, which is the first time I had heard that, but I was like, well, that's a, an interesting option, and of course something that we're doing with you. So I'm gonna stop there because I've talked a lot, <laughs> um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you have, and I do have more slides if you have questions about things I thought you might have questions on, so yeah. So I was there in 2018, and I think it's not a place that a lot of Americans go yeah. to. So I guess the question to you is how do, why should this be of any interest actually to Americans, and how do you get that on their radar? Yeah. I think this is of interest to Americans for a couple of reasons. First is that it's a democracy. Um, and I think, you know, we care about democracy and we care about Southeast Asia. There's a certain irony here. I teach an ethics of war class and we're just talking about Vietnam and how much we really cared about Southeast Asia, you know, in the 1970s. Um, but I think, you know, this is also a chance to address an ethnic minority issue um, that really is, you know, we're talking about the mo most vulnerable people. And if the U.S. can't stand up for the most vulnerable people in the world, then what hope do they have, right? Because it's, it's clear, ASEAN's not going to come to save the day. China's not going to come to save the day. Um, really, if the U.S. or the EU's Western allies don't support Myanmar, then they, <coughs> then they, they're like, we are left with the options of either live under, you know, dictatorship and slavery, or to fight, you know, insurgencies. And I think that's really risky. So what I was looking at in Rohingya, it, with the Rohingya before the coup happened, is that ISIS was starting to recruit people in the Rohingya refugee camps. And so if you don't support an opposition, they're going to find a way to continue fighting, and that might not necessarily be in our interest. I also think stability in Southeast Asia is really important. If you think about the global economy and all the supply chain problems that we're having now, so much commerce travels through the seas. Um, and while the, the Straits and Malacca aren't exactly where Myanmar is, you know, if you have instability throughout Southeast Asia, it destabilizes other democracies that we are allied with. Um, it destabilizes Bangladesh, which then could destabilize India and have all these, all these knock-on effects. It also provides a propaganda point for China. I think in this larger, so, so we have kind of two really interesting kind of global power conversations going on right now. The conversation with Russia is, is feels much more about brute force and power. The, China, the conversation with China is really about interests and worldviews and kind of how the world should be organized. Should the world be organized by democracies um, and should that be respected? Or should we just kind of not really care about democracies and care more about economic growth? I think we'll lose that conversation if we're not engaged in a place like that. I just, I just think it's such a challenge because yes. he Zelensky this morning speaking to the Congress and you watch the Twitter feed and all these folks saying, you know, yeah. why is this our business? Yeah. And so, and here's poor Myanmar, you know, who's hardly on anybody's radar screen and how do you yeah. pay attention to it? Yeah, no, I think it's a huge issue and that's why the loss of Aung San Suu Kyi as an advocate is so devastating. 
because like honestly like 2018 2019 2020 before the coup um Aung San Suu Kyi had really lost the moral support she lost the moral standing that she'd had and that's a connection that you can make right like people can kind of remember maybe oh I remember Aung San Suu Kyi she won the Nobel Prize without that kind of a strong advocate because um if I go back to the side I mean these people are nothing in the United States you know I mean nobody recognizes anyone from here they don't look like Americans you know we, we haven't heard them speak in the way Zelensky speaks um, and part of this is also because Myanmar is in a region that that Western media doesn't cover like honestly the the, the media sources that are doing the best job of covering Myanmar are Al Jazeera you know and some of the European uh, some of the European media but really, in Australian media covers it to a certain degree. But yeah, it's just not getting the coverage. So yeah, it's a really, really hard argument to make. And that would be the case of where we have actually, in, in Minnesota, we have a really strong Karen community. And those people are, are kind of taking action as the diaspora to try and be the voices of those people. I had a student right, right as the coup was happening who was Karen. And he was in my class and he came to me like a day into the class and he was like, I think I have to go fight for my country. And I was like, well, I, okay, <laughs> you know, I'm not gonna stop you. But I think, you know, that's where people in that community are really feel, are really struggling. Um, and it's a connection that, that St. Ben's and St. John's has had for a long time. We do a student-led documentary series called Extending the Link, and they actually did a series with one of our current graduates um, on the Thai Burma border, just kind of raising, um, so I think the more we talk about it, you know, I basically every year I try to create 50 students who really, really know a lot about this, and some of them go on to do more research about it. I just had a student who graduated last year who presented at the um, APSA, the American Political Science Association Student Conference on his project about the Rohingya. So, you know, hopefully we generate more attention about it, but you're right, it's a very hard argument in the United States where they don't look like the people from Ukraine look. They're not traveling with their pets. We can't relate well, to Well, and they're not, not big sources of commerce, and you just right. really don't buy or, you know, trade, so. Yeah, yeah, no, it makes it really hard, yeah. So why isn't India a part of this? That's a really, really good question. I actually have had this conversation with an Indian graduate student at a conference once. Um, if you look at Modi's India right now, it is heavily Hindu nationalist, and the Rohingya are a Muslim minority. Modi's government just passed a law that would basically strip citizenship from Muslim individuals. Yeah, and so in certain provinces, and it's been really challenging. So I think that, you know, India has actually a really long history of, of taking in refugees and welcoming refugees, but not the Rohingya. And so, um, and, and they haven't been active on the Myanmar issue. They certainly haven't, you know, Bangladesh needs all the support it can get. It's getting a lot of support from the United States um, to kind of help cope with these refugees, but they need a lot more than that. So, yeah, India has not been um, a great ally on this. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. I want to go into ancient history for a moment. You listed some of the products that the country produces. Mm -hmm. you go back to World War II days, Burma was exceedingly important to both the Japanese and the Allies for the rubber that they produce. Mm -hmm. They still produce rubber in Myanmar? Yes. I'm sure that they do. Um, so that might not have listed, have gone up to the level of the industries that I discussed, but I'm sure that they do still produce rubber. Yeah, we have uh, artificial rubber from tires nowadays. Yeah. Uh, rubber was very important to World War II because everybody walked all over it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the Japanese, I mean, that's kind of the sad thing about Burma is that they have constantly been fighting off these different colonial empires and very much in the same way that Vietnam you know was like can we please just have freedom from the French now during World War II you know um, Burma was searching for independence from Great Britain and you know eventually got that independence but um, you know it's it, it makes it harder to have that kind of underlying civil society 
and kind of strength in, in the underlying government if you're ruled by a military junta for 50 years. Okay. Yeah. Does ASEAN have interests that are really distinct from South Korea, Japan, and China? I mean, are they that dramatically different? They are somewhat dramatically different in that they are less tied in to the major market economies. So like Japan and South Korea, and so Myanmar would really like to be better tied in with Japan, but of course now it's making this choice like, well, we could be tied in with Japan, but that usually comes with strings attached, whereas if we get tied in with China, we don't have the same strings. There's also kind of an interesting thing that's happened with economic development in the region. You know, if we think back to the 1980s and China's economic rise, a lot of that economic rise came from really basic manufacturing, right? Toys and textiles. Now China makes much more sophisticated projects like, like iPhones, which means they've outsourced those lower level manufacturing to places in Southeast Asia like Vietnam and even Myanmar. If you I, so. Before COVID, I actually went to the St. Cloud's Crossroads Mall because I was very interested in looking at the clothing and where it was made. And if you go into H&M, you can find clothing that's made in Myanmar. And I found that shocking because um, this was like in 2018, 2019. Um, so, you know, that's, that's kind of an interesting development where those countries are, they're emerging economies for sure, although you can see Myanmar's economy tanked. Um, they're emerging economies, but they're not quite at that level to play at the same um, level that South Korea and Japan are. Yeah. 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 I have two questions. Okay. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the Korean people and um, their rule and why we're seeing so many refugees here. And then my other question is, um, how did your students resolve things? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. So the first question is about the Karen. Um, so the Karen, I think in one of my maps, it has the ethnic. Sorry, I don't want to give anyone a flash. Yes. So the Karen have. Um, been fighting the military in this country. So they have never, they've never had democracy per se, right? They don't, they never felt included in the government. So we have lots of Korean populations that are here in the United States. Um, they tend to struggle, you know, I, I think about yesterday was equal pay day. And so that was the day that, you know, women have finally made as much as men after a year in the uh, For Southeast Asian immigrants, that day is probably a year from now. And so we, it, 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 you see a lot of differences there. Um, I think the Korean people um, have a lot of loyalty to the region. And honestly, if I were the Korean, I wouldn't trust the NUG completely. Because the Burmese people, as the Rohingya genocide was happening, we're kind of like, whatever, we're fine with it. There are actually great interviews that Al Jazeera has done, you know, in the in the Myanmar, in the capital of Myanmar, and they're like, uh, the people out on the streets, you know, we love Aung San Suu Kyi, but prior to the prior to the coup, and they ask them, they're like, well, what do you think about the genocide? They're like, oh, it's fine. I, you know, I don't have any opinions about it. You know, so the real, so that's why people are here, and they're probably going to keep coming now because. They are continuing to fight in really, really terrible conditions. And just over the border is Thailand, which isn't any more favorable to them. And so I think as long as that conflict is happening, uh, it will be a problem. Your second question, I forgot. How do your students? So oh, yes, how do my students? So a lot of times they want uh, ASEAN to kick Myanmar out. And I always ask them, I'm like, well, does the ASEAN Charter actually let you do that? Um, because I don't think it does. So a lot of times they kick Myanmar out, which then I have to kind of remind them that like all the autocratic members of ASEAN have now left ASEAN, so your organization is now half as powerful as it was before. Um, a lot of times they want to see the UN bring more humanitarian aid. And I remind them that I'm like, the UN is only as powerful as the states that support it. Um, 
kind of deliberately the U.S. is not a part of the of, of the crisis simulation because I want them to try and kind of grapple with the regional issues. When China is involved, uh, sometimes China will support um, the ethnic militias, which is actually pretty accurate. They've often sold weapons to the militias, which is why the Myanmar military generals are kind of sketched out about them. But basically, if they're not getting support from China now, they're not getting support from, from almost anyone. Um, so yeah, they, they, you know, what something that about it that they recognize is that it's actually really, really hard to solve these problems. And even when they do get to some resolution, they say, yeah, that probably isn't completely realistic. But they also get a good understanding because at the same time that they're trying to negotiate, there's a running tally of news stories that are happening as they're negotiating. And they realize that like, the challenges that global leaders have, because of course the world doesn't stop while you're trying, though you can't push pause on the world as you're trying to solve other problems. So they do some good thinking, but yeah, they struggle too. Yeah. How calm was the governing structure under colonialism? Did we have all these tribal issues? Yes. Yes. I mean, that's because that's the Burmese independence force, that's all these ethnic militias have all existed for a long time. And so, um, and that's where you get, um, I can't walk too far, um, Arakan, or um, the Rakhine area, which is where the Rohingya are, that's like used to be called the Arakan Empire or something. So you have kind of these indigenous groups have kind of always existed there. Um, but, you know, they also were struggling with colonialism. When you asked the question about World War II, I thought you were going to talk about opium. And I'm like, yes, that was also um, a big export of, of Burma at the time. And so, yeah, the, you know, it's, it's a place, it, it's an interesting issue. It's very different than a place like uh, Bosnia, even though they have some similarities, because in Bosnia, you have all these ethnic groups they were under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They've kind of been passed around to different empires, actually very similar to Ukraine. Um, but under communism, you know, the former Republic of Yugoslavia, people lived side by side and it was kind of okay, you know? Um, now there were lots of unresolved issues from World War II that the nationalist leaders exploited at the end of the Cold War. Um, here, I'm not sure that people ever felt there was a burden. You know, I think that's a really interesting question that, that I don't know the answer to. Do, you know, now we know, and, and particularly even more so since 2014, people think there is a Ukraine and like it matters. Like there's a national identity there and there is a, a historical link to that too, even though their territory has kind of shifted over time. I don't know that there is a Burma or a Myanmar. So I would, I think that's a really interesting question that I would have to investigate. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what did that area look like pre, you know, British rule? Right, which I, yeah, I would yeah. have to go back and look at that. Yeah. yeah. I hate the question of um, uh, the present status of um, immigrants in this country uh, up to about three, up to pre, uh, 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 probably two, three years ago. Uh, in our neighborhood and in our suburbs, I saw lots of um, more um, uh, uh, family homes with um, flags um, honoring, um, uh, and uh, and and I've seen more of that has disappeared. Is there something that has happened with immigration? Um, because um, uh, I I could count in uh, immediate neighborhoods uh, 15, 20 different homes that were obviously occupied by immigrants um, who um, uh, had um, uh, flags in their home, but actually flags on their cars. And uh, I see less of that. What has happened with that um, population? Yeah, that's a great question that I don't know the answer to. The only guess that I could make based off my student is that lots of people have returned to fight um, in the country. Young people, people who were born here in the United States, that would be my guess, but I would have to look into that further. I don't think, um, I would guess that um, people from, people that are coming from Myanmar now would have temporary protected status. I'd be shocked if they didn't. Um, but whether if they had immigrated before, you know, and wanted to return, I wouldn't necessarily know what their status is. Although I think there have been a lot of news stories about, um, 
ref, you know, immigrants from that region that never moves towards citizenship and then get caught up in the law and get deported, yeah. but I don't think that's probably Because, it. you know, they were living in single family homes mm -hmm. and, and having, you know, reasonably decent, uh, uh, usually, uh, usually Asian automobiles mm -hmm. and uh, uh, very, uh, very strong uh, uh, ethnic connection. Uh, I would occasionally say, you know, be able to say hello and, mm -hmm. and uh, but very much living unto themselves but they, they have more disappearing you know, okay. than I would have thought. Uh, uh, nothing I, I didn't see that that much has changed for safe return to the country. Right, definitely not. No, I will look into that further because I, I would like to know more about the community here and changes especially recent mm -hmm. changes. Yeah. That's a great question. Questions? Well, I'll just show you since everyone seemed really interested. Uh, well, this is COVID 19, so obviously they're not doing super well here, although they've tracked with kind of the different waves of COVID. Um, uh, the economy is still not doing very well. Um, these are the cases of the International Court of Justice. So uh, this relationship with China is really interesting. Um, they had actually cultivated a lot of relationships with a lot of the civilian leaders because they said that's what's happening, that's where the country is going. Um, so they were actually kind of slow to recognize the junta. They are, the immediate statement after the coup, they did not sign on to any of the condemnations of the United Nations, but they did say, we, you, you can't dissolve the NLD, like you can't ban this party, like somehow you're going to return to civilian rule and the NLD needs to still exist. Um, because they had invested a lot in those relationships. Now more recently, I think China's like, the coup seems like it's here to stay, and so they're kind of restarting some of these relationships. But Myanmar is actually a very important part of some of China's brick and road initiatives, um, to the bigger kind of economic projects of China, and they're a little worried now um, because the NUG has said it will not honor any debts undertaken by the military junta, and so China doesn't know like what's going to happen with these big economic development projects the military junta is signing off on. What's going to happen if the government changes again? And then you know here's all the different phases of Aung San Suu Kyi. But here, this is the one I wanted to show you, which is arms sales. So this is data from uh, Cipri, which is the Swedish uh, is Swedish think tank that tracks arms sales, and you can see kind of all of the countries that were providing arms sales uh, before the junta, uh, before the coup. Uh, Russia, China, and Serbia continue to provide, and Israel continue to provide weapons. What, yeah. What's the interest? What's the appeal for you? Why are you so? You know, I think I have an interest, so when I wrote uh, my dissertation and then my book on military interventions, I looked at the Malayan emergency, and so in general I find the region really interesting. And in, in 2017, when I returned from sabbatical and was teaching my class, I had been using a crisis simulation on Iran's nuclear weapons, and I just felt like I wanted to change. And so I actually looked at the situation in Myanmar and I was like, nobody knows about this. Like, this is a really good opportunity to really get a whole group of students at least more educated and informed and honestly like mobilized on this issue. It's been really interesting to see how I hear lots of stories from alums when they come back and they say I still follow this issue. So it doesn't, you know, I can't say it's been a movable change in terms of policy, but at least more people care about it and are aware of it. So. And you can get enrollment in your classes. So. Yes, yes, <laughs> students know, students know what's going to happen and it's very exciting. So, yeah. You mentioned very briefly the Belt Road Initiative. Yes. How does Myanmar play a part in that? Because they are so far south. Yeah, let me see. I'll just go back. So what they, what China wants to do, so obviously, so this is Yunnan province here in China, and they have big, big problems with poverty there. So they have a lot of economic development projects there. Then they also have a railway that goes through Myanmar and several uh, natural gas developments. 
there. So those are some of the bigger pieces. I think it's also a piece, it, it, it might be related to you know, getting better uh, transportation routes through Bangladesh to India and Pakistan um, for other elements of the Belt and Road Initiative as well. You're right that they seem so far south, but I think they have a lot of railway projects that they're trying to get done. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you.